Uh, If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 22. Acts 22. We've been going through the book of Acts, and if you're trying to keep uh, count, it's been almost 18 months, okay? 18 months, because we are taking it word by word, line by line, and uh, we have enjoyed uh, the series in Acts. Today, I want to speak to you on the subject of In the Line of Fire. Now listen to me, folks. If you are doing something for Jesus Christ, you're going to be in the line of fire. Okay? They that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So get ready for it. And I will say this also. The deeper we go in and closer to the rapture of the church and the tribulation period and all the end times, the more intense that persecution is going to be. So we need to be ready. And I think uh, the Apostle Paul is a good person we need to emulate when we think about that. Let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow with us. uh, We would love for you to do that. Number one, the action of the crowd. The action of the crowd. And folks, I'm just telling you, there are people that do the wrong thing and encourage others to do the wrong thing. All right? We need to be aware of that. Number two, the misunderstanding of the Romans. The misunderstanding of the Romans. The Roman soldiers really did not know what Paul was about and what uh, he was doing and misunderstood. And number three, the change of heart. The change of heart. Folks, God can change anyone. God can change anyone. Uh, Turn to uh, John chapter 15. I want to use this as as an introduction. John 15, 18. We will start there. Jesus told his disciples many times uh, that after he leaves earth, they will be persecuted and even die for the cause of Christ. Several times in the Gospels, you will hear Jesus speaking of that, and this is one of the times. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, You know that it hated me before it hated you. Folks, here is the perfect son of God. Here is a man that all he did was try to help people. Here was all he did was try to point people to Jesus and salvation. But you remember they said, crucify him, crucify him. So do not be surprised if the world hates you. And we're not talking about the earth, the sphere itself. Okay, the world is people other than Christians. It is the lost, the lost. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. They don't like that we go to church. They don't like, you you know, that we, uh, you know, talk about and witness about Christ. Their values are usually not our values. And I understand there's some good people out there. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about as we go on in history, people are getting real aggressive in their beliefs. And it's border hate. It really is. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He was telling the disciples, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be able to protect you like you think. Uh, you know, they, Jesus really was the disciples' security blanket, all right? He, he did. He protected them. He guided them. He showed them what they needed to be doing. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute the, you. If they keep my word, they will keep your word also. So there will be a dividing line somewhere in your life to where somebody that you are around thinks you crossed the line. And when that pressure is on, I'm telling you, it's going to show who you are in Jesus Christ. Folks, anybody can serve God in the good times. Anybody can. But what about the times of persecution? What about when people gang up on you? What about when people are ugly to you? Folks, it happens. It's this thing called life. 
And Jesus was preparing his disciples for that, and we need to prepare our hearts for the very same thing. Throughout the book of Acts, we have seen Peter and Paul persecuted, beaten, thrown in jail, and they will eventually die for being Christians and sharing the gospel. If you think about it, from the beginning of the Acts 2 New Testament church, Jewish opposition has always been there. It was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, and other Jewish leaders that hated Jesus and hated this thing called Christianity, and in their day was the way. It should be no surprise to us that as time goes on, we Christians will be facing more opposition and more persecution. My prayer is that we will not compromise, back up, shut up, stop teaching or preaching or witnessing in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. And today we're going to look at another injustice in the life of the Apostle Paul. Folks, it is not a crime to share the gospel of Christ with someone. It's not a crime in even sharing it with others. Now, let's look at our text. Acts chapter 22, verse 22. The action of the crowd. And you have to remember, I know it's been two weeks, or maybe three now, but they, they, they put Paul in front of this crowd. And they, they said, Paul was trying to explain to him why he did what he did. All right, they accused him of blasphemy. They accused him of bringing a Gentile into the court, the temple courts, what was breaking the Jewish law. But he did not do that. These people were lying on him. And everything was okay till they got to that last uh, sentence there in verse 21. Depart, for I will send you far away from here to the Gentiles. And when he said the word Gentiles, they went crazy. Why? Because he was putting them on the same level as the Jews. Folks, my Bible says everyone everywhere needs Christ. God is no respecter of person. God loves the Jews and the Gentiles the same. He, and, and they felt like he was breaking their laws and what they really was, and I tell you what, they interpreted it as is a rejection, a put down. And folks, there are times in our lives that we say things and people misinterpret what we are saying. But this crowd, look at their actions in verse 22. And they listened to him until this word, that word was Gentile. And then they raised their voices. Okay, we're not talking about talking loudly. We are talking about yelling. We are talking about violent, violently yelling. We're talking about aggressive yelling, making a scene, all right? And they said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. They're saying, Paul, you deserve to die for what is going on. Oh, folks, most crowds like this, it is out of pure hate, folks. It's pure hate. They hated the Apostle Paul. He used to be one of them. All he did was give his testimony of the truth of his salvation. And they wanted him dead. They wanted him dead. Then look at verse 23. Then, they, then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under a scourging so he might know why they shouted against him. Folks, I am telling you, what does this remind you of? Folks, the first thing it reminds me of is how they treated Jesus. How they treated Jesus. And they ended up crucifying him on a cross. The second thing it reminds me of in, in Acts chapter 7 is how they treated Stephen. Stephen told them, told them the truth and the gospel. Stephen said, you were the ones that crucified Jesus Christ and he was stoned to death. Folks, I am telling you, I, I do not like mobs like this. I do not like gangs either. You know why? Because they are cowards. They are cowards. And I'm not 
promoting fighting, but any time a group of people do something to one person, and folks, we've seen it on TV, we've seen it in law enforcement where they, I'm telling you, they just beat people till they're almost die, till they almost die. And folks, you cannot justify that. You can't. And this mob was growing crazy. They were accusing Paul of blasphemy. They were throwing dirt up in the air. And all this was going on, and they were ready to murder. They were ready. I'm telling you, if the Romans had not intervened, they would have killed Paul on the spot. Folks, let me say this. There's danger in anger. There's danger in anger. And folks, if you stay around an angry person long enough, you will get their wrath. It may not be today. It may not be next week. But angry people have trouble controlling their tempers. And when they get in a fit of rage, I've seen them red-faced and mad. I've seen them swear. I've seen them physically try to do harm to people. And folks, this action of the crowd was wrong. Paul was caught up in the middle of it, and Paul had done nothing. He had done nothing. Matter of fact, let's go back to the first case of anger. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. Here's where it started. And really it started at the fall at Adam and Eve when they fell in the third chapter. But the first uh, uh, danger and anger. Look at Genesis 4 verse 1. Now Adam and knew Eve and his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And I have acquired a man from the Lord, and she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. So we have first sibling, Cain and Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Just common, you know. Uh, boys are not always alike, okay? Some play sports, some don't. Some want to be a farmer, some don't. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Well, if you look at it, uh, you know how some people say, well, that's not fair. God didn't accept. He accepted Abel's, but not Cain's. And what was the issue, folks? I'll tell you what Cain's issue was. It wasn't with what he brought. Some people say, well, he should have brought an animal. That wasn't, folks, an offering's an offering. And there's different kinds of offerings. His problem was his attitude. And God called him out on it. Look what he says. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Folks, I have learned in my life and, and if somebody is in my face angry, then our conversation is over. Okay? I am not going to sit there and listen to that. You mean you'd walk away? That's exactly what I would do. You don't have to put up with that. We are not doormats. I'm not going to be mad. I'm just going to say, listen, when you can talk to me face to face without yelling and we can discuss things, we'll talk. Okay? You do not have to put up with anger in your life. And it says, why has your countenance falling? These people that are angry and have a temper, you don't have to figure out whether they're angry or not. Just look at their face, and they'll tell you whether they are or not. All right? My mom had her face. And when she was standing at the door in a fly swatter in one hand, Folks, I, was no, I knew I was about to get the wrath of Isabel, all right? And fly swatters hurt, okay? They hurt. Now look at this. Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will not be, if you do well, will you not be accepted? God said, if you'd have had the right attitude, we wouldn't have a problem here. But folks, there's two things that angry people get angry most of the time about. Number one, we don't get our way. Hey. We have a 22-month-year-old, Miss Kylie Isabel Franklin. If she don't want to do it, she'll look at you and go, no. And there are times we have to have attitude adjustments with our children. Okay? 
And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Folks, you can't take back words that you have said. You can apologize for it. You can say you really didn't mean it. You can say I was joking about it. But people know when you're angry. And when you're angry, you do things that you wouldn't do and should not do. Cain was guilty as charged. God called his hand on it, and he would not repent. And it says, and if you do well, sin lies at the door and it's desire for you, but you should rule over it. Okay, you don't have to be angry. You don't have to. They have all kinds of courses, even at work, you know, courses on how to handle anger and tempers. And it says, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. Folks, I don't think they had an argument one day and he just thought, you know what? Today I'm just going to kill my brother. The more he thought about it, the more he stewed on it, the more God called him out and conviction was in his heart. God told him to get right with him and he would not do that. And finally he thought, man, I can't get this off my mind. I will kill my flesh and blood. Folks, it happens all the time. Watch the news. That's the dangers of anger. This crowd was angry. This crowd was crazy. And folks, you need to avoid places like that and people like that. So we see the action of the crowd. Second thing, let's look at uh, the misunderstanding of the Romans. Verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, remember they were going to scourge him. And there were two types of scourging in that day. The one Jesus went through is not the one Paul was going to go through. The one that Jesus went through was with, with the cat of nine tails. All right, It had metal, it had stone, and they literally, the Romans, wanted to beat him to death. Okay, The, the commander here did not know what Paul had done. He still hadn't figured it out, and he was trying to get order. They were about to tear him to pieces, so he gets him in the barracks and pulls him, pulls him apart, uh, or takes him in there, and, and he, he's saying, you know, trying to figure out what has this guy done. And one of the deals that Romans did to beat information out of them was they used a simple whip. Now, I say a simple whip, leather straps is going to hurt you. All right, but it's not the same. There's two kinds. And what they did, and, and they literally wanted to beat the information out. Make Paul say what he'd done. They were assuming he was uh, guilty before they even tried him. And folks, that's, that, that's the injustice. Uh, Paul was, uh, you know, he, he was due. He, he should have had a say-so. They shouldn't be like this. Uh, that should not happen. And it says, and Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? See, Paul didn't yell at him. Paul didn't get mad. Paul was calm. Paul reasoned with them. My thing, the only thing I was trying to figure out in this passage was, why didn't Paul say something sooner? And the only thing I could come up with is if they got him ready to beat him, and then he said something, they had already broken a law. Okay, Paul was smart, folks. I was thinking he would use that in his defense later on. But they didn't know he was a Roman citizen. They didn't ask him if he is a Roman citizen. And they just broke the law. And if they break the law, the law that they break will be put on them by Roman law. So Paul here... He was calm. He didn't get mad. He wasn't yelling at people. He wasn't doing anything. He just said, he said, he asked the question, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? It's called due process of law. He was assuming Paul was guilty because of the rage of the crowd. Oh, folks, you've got to listen to both sides of the story. You've got to reason. You've got to think. You have to use discernment. People lie all the time. 
all the time. And you have to get the facts before you start saying things. So these Roman soldiers misunderstood Paul. Now, verse 26, And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. So I am just telling you, when he told that, and he, understand, he understood what was going on, everything changed. Claudius, uh, who was the head of the Roman soldiers then, said, whoa, wait a minute. We had no idea this was going on. In verse 27, then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The question that he should have asked before all this broke out, the first thing he should have asked him was not even asked. And folks, I am telling you, there will be some situations in your life which are just totally unfair. Okay, totally unfair. And folks, we have to learn as Christians to stay calm, to use reason, to talk. It's like we tell our children with our quiet voice. All right? Because folks, we represent Jesus Christ in everything we do. We are Christians. We are believers. And some people think, well, I could just say, and, and it's like, I want to give them a piece of your mind, piece of my mind. Folks, I'm telling you, I need all of my mind that I have. All right? I can't go giving it away. I really can't. Because usually when you give it away, you say the wrong thing. Folks, let me put it this way. There are mean people out there. They just woke up. They fell out of bed when they got up. The toast was burnt. Their coffee maker didn't work, and they had a flat tire. And they're just looking for somebody to take it out on. And folks, we live with these folks. And the most important thing, he had just given his testimony. What if he'd have got up there and just started screaming at the crowd? Do you see how in one sentence sometimes we can lose our testimony. And folks, God is going to make things right. Well, he hadn't made it right in 20 years, folks. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Everyone will stand before God and give an account of themselves. You and everyone that is breathing on this earth. We are not judge, jury, and executioners. Many times, we cannot change someone's mind. But we have to do the right thing. We're Christians. We're Christians. And we need to do the right thing. Then Paul answers him. He says, and this is the commander speaking in verse 28, with a large sum of money, I obtained the citizenship. You know what he's saying? We bribed. I'm a Roman citizen because my dad or somebody bribed. Okay? All right. There, yes, there's corruption in government. All right, if you don't think there is, uh, I've got some land in the Bahamas I want to sell you, okay? I mean, you are a fool. Seriously. There is corruption, but it doesn't uh, justify our bad actions. He said, the commander, man, my dad bribed, or somebody had money and bribed their way in. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. And this changed everything. That changed everything. I'm telling you, that commander got where he couldn't swallow. That commander probably started backing up and thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to get out of this? I mean, he did the wrong thing. Paul was unjustly grabbed, unjustly thrown, ready to scourge him, ready to beat him and get the information out of him. And he just realized, oh man, this is going to be a problem. Math, uh, Romans 12. Look at Romans 12. Go to Romans 12 to, with me. Romans 12, verse 9. Well, actually, verse 14. I like 9, but 14 is the verse. Bless those who persecute you. Let me ask you, do you do that? 
And I'll bless him, all right? I'll bless him. I'll give him five reasons. Folks, calm down. Calm down. People get fired up. I'm amazed at people fired up in lines. Just standing in lines. People get fired up. When people merge into traffic, people get fired up. At t-ball games, parents get fired up. They were going to beat up an umpire a couple of weeks ago when we were out at a ballpark, I'll say. And I'm like, are y'all crazy? It's t-ball. The kids walk in after the game and says, did we win? They have no clue who won. No clue. And they're getting mad because of a call. All right? Calm down. You're not only representing Jesus Christ, you are representing Rye Hill Baptist Church also. You know how sometimes God just gets us to where we do something somewhere else, and then that person shows up in our life, just they're there? Folks, it's happened to me. And I say, okay, God, I understand. I understand what you're trying to say to me. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. No reason to curse. No reason. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Folks, you can come to a consensus. You can disagree agreeably. All right? Nobody's right every time. You're not the exception. Let me help you. Everybody is wrong sometimes. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Paul showed humility. Paul showed love. Paul showed grace. Paul showed forgiveness. Paul showed these things in his life. Do not be wise in your own opinion. All right? Your opinion, I'm telling you, everyone got one. It's kind of like ears. You got two of them. Everybody's got an opinion. That doesn't mean yours is right. Okay? Here it is. Repay no one evil for evil. You know what you're doing? You're playing into their hands when you get angry also. You are losing, losing the battle when you get angry also. Folks, I am telling you, the Bible says do not. You, you have done. You are being just like that person. Folks, who are we supposed to be like? Jesus. Would Jesus do that? Folks, he didn't. Liars. False uh, accusations. False accusations. And in the Gospels, many times Jesus said, did not say a word. Why? Because you're not going to change that person's mind. You're not going to do it. Folks, you're not going to do it. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it is possible. Well, let me quote another verse. With God, all things are possible. And you got the but word right there, but you don't know. But you haven't been around. You don't, and, and folks, you are not the exception. Everybody gets misused. Everybody gets, you know, uh, persecuted in some fashion. If it is possible, as much as depends on you. And folks, there's the key. You can't change that person. And a lot of times you can't change that person's mind. But you can change your attitude about that person. What if we started praying for that person instead of laid in bed thinking, how can I get even with him? How can I get even? What can I say? How can I rebuttal that? What if you just started praying for that person? That's what the Bible says here. He said, depends on you, live peaceful with all men. Do not avenge yourself, but rather give place, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know what your job is? Turn it over to God. Turn it over to God. Well, I want him to do something now. He offended me today. I don't want to wait till next week. Folks, I am telling you. The Bible tells us also in Ephesians chapter. Uh, chapter 4, don't go to bed angry. Angry. Don't go to bed angry. It's wrong, says the Word of God. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Folks, uh, we should do the right thing. Verse 21, do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Folks, I've lost many an argument, all right? I've lost many battles. And the older I get, the more I have learned when I see it escalating, it's time to shut down. Okay, let them do the talking, all right? There's three phrases that we really need to use more often than we do. Three phrases, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. You know, sometimes it's hard to say that. You know, we're kind of like Fonzie, I was wrong, wrong. I, I was wrong, wrong. It just won't come out of your mouth. Be peacemaking. Blessed are the peacemakers. Folks, again, I'm not telling you to be doormats, but being angry and going to bed, the Bible says, is not good. Let's look at the last point back in Acts, the last point back in our text. Not only the action of the crowd, not only a misunderstanding of the Romans, but a change of heart. Then immediately those who drew about him, examined him, uh, drew about to examine him, withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. It's kind of like when you're in grade school. My dad can beat your dad up. I got news for you. My heavenly father can whoop every one of your dads. All right? Let God take care of it. Let God take care of it. All right? Then the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews. He released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before him. I'm telling you, that commander Claudius just started backing up saying, whoa, we're gonna, we're gonna, I, I've had a change of heart. I've had a change of mind. Okay, we're not whooping this guy. All right, he was a, wrong, uh, he, he was a Roman citizen. And do you know what? The bottom line is, Folks, God took care of it. God took care of it. Yes, he was going to die for the cause of the Christ, but not this time. Okay, not this time. We are going to have to suffer at times, but not this time. All right? He had a change of heart. Matthew 10, Matthew 10. Go with me to Matthew 10. Jesus' words again, verse 16. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. That describes our country and world in which we live in. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wisdom comes from God. Ask for godly wisdom on how to deal with the situation. Be aware, be, uh, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before the governors and the kings for my sake as a testimony to them, to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. Folks, don't worry about it. Hey, let me give you a key. Tell the truth. Just tell the truth, okay? For it is not you. It's not what? For it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Folks, God will give you the words to say. He will give you the words to say. One of the frustrations I had one time is Lori and I were coming home uh, from a place and we made a turn and there was a stop sign if you went straight and there was a turn there. And the turn had a yield sign. Well, one of our highway patrol people stopped me, looked at my license and said, Mr. Franklin, you run that stop sign. I said, sir, <laughs> I'm just telling you, I was turning right, there was a yield sign, and so I went through it. No, you didn't. You didn't stop at that stop sign. And gave me a ticket. Well, I got one of our Fort, Sil Fort Smith policemen, one of our fine policemen. I called him on the phone. I said, here's what happened. He said, well, just meet me out there. Let me look. And so we went out there, and he started taking pictures. I said, okay. 
I didn't have to call a lawyer. That was the best part of that, all right? So I show up in court, and I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there. One hour and 15 minutes. Judge comes up, Mr. Michael Franklin, you've been accused of running a stop sign. How do you plead? I said, not guilty. He said, really? And I said, yes. A friend of mine got these pictures. I'll tell you exactly what, and I was starting to pull them out. He said, not guilty. You're free to go. <laughs> and I waited six weeks for this to happen. I waited an hour and 15 minutes for this to happen. Folks, God will work things out. Just tell the truth. The last scripture, Romans 1. Romans 1, the last scripture. I promise. Verse 13. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often have planned to come to you. Folks, Paul's desire, and folks, he's going to get his desire. He wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to speak to the highest authority in the land, and God gave him that but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarian, barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. As much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. What was this whole deal about? Folks, the whole deal was Paul just wanted to give his testimony. Paul just wanted to tell somebody about Jesus. Paul just wanted to tell. See, nobody can refute your testimony. It happened to you. So they can't say, I don't believe that. Well, it did. It happened. It happened. Here it is. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. I've got a sneaky feeling that even chained to prisoners, and I think we can document, document this in history, that Paul led people and Roman soldiers to the Lord who was in the sea cell guarding him. No matter what Paul is saying, my goal is for people to be saved. My goal is to share a testimony. My goal is to lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ for the Jew first, to, for the Greek, for it, is, for it is in righteousness of God as revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. Folks, it's our job. It's our job also to tell people of the good news of Jesus Christ the Lord. Paul took a bad situation and made good from bad. And my prayer is that we will do the same. Father, thank you for the day. God, I thank you for Paul, and I know that it's the Jesus in Paul. I know that. And God, I just thank you that he has set an example for us. And God, we do, we do. We need to keep Jesus in the forefront of our lives. And God, I pray that you would just deal with us today. There might be a situation that happened this week. Lord, I pray that uh, if possible, I, I know phone calls work, I know texts work, but folks, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, makes all the difference in the world. God, we have to do that with ourselves. We have to do it. Sometimes when we break your laws, when we do the wrong thing. So God, I pray that we would be quick to correct those things. God, I pray that we would take every opportunity to share Christ with others around us. Doesn't matter whether they reject us. Doesn't matter even if they get mad at us. We're not trying to make people mad. It's our obligation. We are supposed to go. So God, I pray that we would be bold and fearless in sharing our testimony in the gospel. Or maybe we need to rededicate our life today. Maybe we need to follow the Lord in baptism today or even join the church, God. It, it's you. You tell them. You tell them exactly what they need to do this day. We give you this time, this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?
We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.